On this episode of Heavy Metal Monsters, the gigantic Asian Hercules races to move an oil rig in Singapore. If we miss the tide, we might puncture the hull. They're gonna delay the whole operation. We might have disaster here. And the mighty Tesmec Trencher faces terror on the frozen North Dakotan plain. 100,000 pound machine can slide at any time on them hillside. Whoa! It starts being a living thing that's kind of scary. That crap rocks. Extreme machines in extreme conditions. Tackle the toughest jobs on the planet. This is Heavy Metal Monsters. Singapore, this is the world's biggest oil rig manufacturer. We dominate around 60% of the world market. The rigs built here are sent to the far corners of the world to satisfy our insatiable demand for oil. These massive drilling machines are built in separate sections, then welded together. Each finished piece must be fitted precisely into place. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You have to be 100% perfect to lock into that position. Each section weighs up to 3,000 tons, and they have to be lifted. For that, you need a floating monster crane. Asian Hercules II, a giant of the seas. Height, 393 feet. Lift capacity, 3,500 tons. Engines, 7,800 horsepower diesel generators. Even though it's such a big crane, it is very nimble. You can turn on the spot. Today, the crew of the Asian Hercules faces a mammoth challenge. The bow of a multi-million dollar oil rig must be transported to the other side of the harbor, dropped exactly onto these support blocks and welded to the main hull. But this section weighs 3,000 tons. Captain Mir Mahmood is the man in charge. Well, it's hell of a big lift. It's a big challenge, actually. 7 a.m. Captain Mahmood gathers his team. When you work, watch your fingers. When you connect your shackles, look for your friends. So but the biggest problem for the crew is timing the operation to coincide with high tide. It's a lift and go. If they miss their window, it could be catastrophic. If we miss the tide, they may be grounded. So you might puncture the hull. So you might have a disaster here. The first challenge is to couple the rig section to the Asian Hercules crane. To lift these enormous loads takes mega ropes. Each length is around 4,400 meters. It's almost 4.4 kilometer in one length. Below deck, Three giant diesel generators supply power to massive winches, carefully controlled from the bridge. Despite the crane's power, this 3,000 ton lift will test Asian Hercules to the max. Basically, she's on the limits. Lifting manager Thet Tuza first attaches two giant slings to the crane's hook. Each sling carries four cables, which connect to the rig's eight anchor points. Every lift is a challenge for us. Every aspect we have to check to ensure this is a safe lift. The heavy-duty slings help distribute the massive weight. We need to get in a special cable to lift up this weight because normal sling is not enough for this capacity. Bosun Louis is in charge of attaching the cables to the rig. But the cables are tangled. They've been left in a gap just two meters wide, and they're stuck. Chief engineer Mr. Chauvindran is worried they're going to miss their window. If we miss the tide, we have to wait for another six hours. They're going to delay the whole operation. Every hour is cost money. The clock is ticking. If they miss time this lift, Asian Hercules could be grounded in the falling water. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. 
Two miles outside Epping, North Dakota. The peace of the empty North Dakotan plain has been shattered. The reason? Oil. 7.4 billion barrels of it, buried in 25,000 square miles of porous rock. Money. One minute you're dead broke and desperate to find a job and you don't know what you're gonna do. Three weeks later, 70 hours a week, you're just praying to God for a day off. You got all the money in your bank account. To transport the oil, Lowenbro Construction is building an 80 mile pipeline through ground frozen solid by temperatures as low as 20 degrees below zero. Digging through this frozen tundra takes a truly awesome machine. This is the Tesmec 1075 Trencher. Weight, 44 tons. Digging depth, seven feet. Digging width, 40 inches. The 325 horsepower diesel engine gives the enormous earth mover the grunt to shift 2,700 tons of dirt every hour. This trencher, this particular trencher is heavy enough that it can, you can go down seven and a half feet and, and dig all day long if you need to. The Tesmex is amazing. It replaces three track hose all in one go. It means that we can dig our trenches in super fast time. To bring the pipeline in on time, these guys have to lay a mile of pipe every day. 5 a.m. Dawn is still an hour away. Project Superintendent Donnie has to make sure the entire 50-man crew keeps to schedule and stays alive in these treacherous conditions. These oil guys are on me hard, and we gotta meet our deadlines. We gotta get the oil in the pipe and get going. Okay, guys, we really gotta take this serious. That's all there is to it. Let's do it and go. They've got just 10 hours to lay 125 sections of steel pipe before it gets too dark to work. The ground is covered with up to two feet of snow, so the three Cat D8 dozers start by clearing a path for the trencher. The next step is for the excavators to loosen the ground. But this is the steepest terrain the crew has faced in more than 70 miles of pipeline. And the frozen turf is causing massive problems for the big machines. You get on hillsides, and if you're not paying attention, it'll take off and start sliding just like a sleigh. You'd be amazed at how little of a hillside you have to be on, and whew, you're going for a ride. <laughs> it'll take off. As the excavator sets to work on the slope, the metal track slips on the icy ground. If they don't get the 38-ton excavator under control, it could be the end of the line for the oil. Yeah. Singapore Harbor. The gigantic floating crane Asian Hercules is preparing to lift a 3,000-ton section of oil rig. But the 11 inch thick lifting cables have become entangled in the crowded shipyard. Each 170 foot long cable weighs over 20 tons, but any twists or kinks can cause them to fail. We have to ensure that the cable does not twist. Any twist, then the wire might be damaged. Once the wire damage, definitely we cannot get out the lift. The crew has to move the rig at high tide or risk a grounding. They race to attach the giant two-ton shackles. Move out, move out. Hey, 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 look up. Move out. Eventually, Bosun Louie manages to free the cables, and they are quickly hoisted up into position. Now, the shackles must be attached to the eight anchor points on the rig. But time is running out. 
finally the crane and rig are connected. The deck is cleared and the lift is on. Okay, guys, are you ready? On the bridge, Captain Mahmoud begins pretensioning the gigantic cables. All right, good, we're on 70%. Okay, guys, are Asian Hercules takes the strain. But the massive weight of the rig tips the crane forward. It's dangerously unstable. So to balance the deck, ballast tanks at the back take in 6,000 tons of seawater. If we do not balance the tanks, she will just sink, or the whole crane will just uh, topple forward. The ballast helps stabilize the crane, but with the lifting window closing fast, the crew needs to move before the tide leaves them high and dry. Epi, North Dakota. The mighty Tesmec trencher is churning through 40 tons of frozen earth per minute. What's wrong? ready for the next section of pipeline to be laid. But up ahead, the 38-ton excavator is sliding dangerously on the icy slopes. The excavator hangs on, but the ice takes its toll. The frozen ground has sheared the solid steel bucket. This bucket's starting to crack out. This side's worse. Same on this side, and he needs to get his new teeth. Another day of this, and that whole bucket be ruined. So they'll break in half. We don't get it fixed right away. It's a major blow. They have to take it out of action and weld a repair. Without the excavator's help, the trencher is moving slower than scheduled. It's really hard on the machine, so pretty soon all heck breaks loose. After four hours, they've laid only a quarter mile of pipe, half their target. Trencher operator Lincoln's working flat out to make up for lost time. But he's hit a problem. That crap rocks. And it's a big one. Hey, Robert, I need you to come down here and, and fish out a bunch of rocks in front of the trencher. All right, I'm on my way, Link. A heavy excavator, capable of shifting loads up to 6,000 pounds, comes in to move the boulder. The excavator and the trencher kind of work hand in hand. When he hits rocks that are too big, I got to dive in there and get it out for him so that we can keep on trucking. But even with the hard rock gone, the trencher's not out of trouble. You broke a tooth? Yeah, snapped a few rocks. Yeah, you'll probably have to Spin it, find it, and get the welders over here to weld the back on. So. All right. Um, uh, stop me where you need to. All righty. The trencher needs a weld, too. But there's not enough welders to fix all the broken teeth and man the pipeline. This could stall the entire project. What the hell are you doing up here? I think you're supposed to be welding in the pipeline. I'm not going to get moving if you're over here blowing smoke at me. Singapore Harbor. The gigantic floating crane Asian Hercules is about to lift the 3,000 ton oil rig section. All right, uh, Louis, let's start the lift. Okay. Inch by inch, the huge chunk of metal rises into the air. Even with 6,000 tons of ballast on board to counteract the weight, the front of the crane sits just inches above the water. When you start the lift, we can't stop, so the, the, the clock starts ticking, and we have to race against time. We are telling to port, are we? Captain Mahmoud steers the crane out into the harbor. A minute later, an Asian Hercules would have been grounded in the falling water. We were to the extreme of the tidal constraint. I think we are only 10 or 20 millimeters above the seabed. Just watch out eh, for any fast crabber. Chasing the tide, the crew prepares to run a three-mile gauntlet across one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. I'm one on our starboard side. We have to monitor the passing vessels. Fast boat, fast tugboat creates swell. 
it will create some problem for us. It will cause the weight or the blocks to sway from left to right. The huge weight of the bow section is pushing Asian Hercules to the limit. With the front of the crane so close to the water, a swell now could swamp the deck and push the crane under. Edging towards the opposite dock, these are nail-biting moments. Captain Mahmoud sights the giant floating dock that holds the main section of the rig. Now he must swing the final piece of the puzzle into place. But it's suddenly clear that the rig is on a collision course with the towers of the floating dock. We have to go over the tower. How much you want? How much you need? The only solution is to lift the rig over. But the higher it gets, the more unstable it becomes. Epi, North Dakota. The Tesmec 1075 trencher needs a new tooth after chowing down on hard rock. To get the job done fastest, they bring in head welder Aaron. Where's your pro cat, Wayne? Just to grind it off. Well, sometimes I feel like a dentist. Takes in lots of teeth on that trencher. 2 p.m. With Aaron away, the welding team sealing the pipes have only managed to finish a quarter of a mile. We gotta get going, we got people here, what the hell? Boss man Donnie is not happy about Aaron's extracurricular activities. What the hell are you doing up here? I thought you are supposed to be welding in the pipeline. Well, somebody needs to make this a phone call get... and find out what's more important. Is... We gotta get going, you gotta get back to pipelining. We gotta get the hell out of here. I'm not gonna get moving if you're over here blowing smoke at me. Aaron's very feisty. We just butt he heads like rams. But while they argue, the day's target is slipping further out of reach. Epping, North Dakota. The Tasmec 1075 trencher is battling against hard, frozen earth and now a broken tooth has taken it out of action. As soon as head welder Aaron finishes the fix, operator Lincoln surges ahead to make up the lost time. We have serious amounts of pipe to lay. Our head's against the gun every day. The welder's lane pipe need every hand on the job, including Aaron. Right on the weld. Just to keep up with the pace. As the sun sets, Lincoln and the trencher power past the all-important mile mark. Get it on. We already got it. Thank you, guys. By the time the welding team catches up, darkness is already falling. But now, the pipe is within seven miles of the finish line. Amigo, we're done. The end of this epic project is finally in sight. Thank you for the help. That's great. Thank you. Singapore Harbor. The crew of the Asian Hercules have made it across the shipping lanes, but now the towers of the floating dock are dangerously close to the suspended rig. Elengo, you stop us, boss. Elengo. I mean the starboard side. Ah, uh, need to see the starboard. I think ah, uh, five, six, six. On the bridge, Captain Mahmoud uses the power of the floating crane to hoist the massive section up and over. Right, I'm limited to go up. Block stop. Ah, enough, ah. Hanging more than 65 feet in the air, any sudden movements could spell disaster. Alpha, pull to port, half speed. You have to go inching very slowly. Asian Hercules lowers the giant section into place. But with just a foot to go, the crew on top of the rig hits a snag. Yeah. 
The new section is catching on pipes, sticking out from the existing structure. But the crane is at full stretch. It cannot come ahead anymore, already touching, so they might need to cut. The pipes must be cut, and quickly. The super-fast crew cut and run. And Asian Hercules lowers the 3,000-ton section into position. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Good job, brother. Well thank you. Nice. Okay, Louis, thank you very much. In a team effort, everybody plays a part. Asian Hercules 2 did a good job. We are very happy. With the huge structure now complete, the sections are welded together. Soon, this giant rig will be ready for business. On this episode of Heavy Metal Monsters. It's definitely dangerous around here, and I enjoy it. The colossal walking drag line is pumping iron high in the Rockies. Dummies don't survive very long, stupid herds. And the turbocharged all-terrain snowcat is racing to repair a mountaintop radar station. Let's slow it out a little bit so we don't tear up the snowcat. There's a storm coming in tonight, so we do need to get out of here. I am rather concerned about it. Extreme machines in extreme conditions. Tackle the toughest jobs on the planet. This is Heavy Metal Monsters. Meeker, Colorado. More than a mile up in the Rocky Mountains lies the Kalawayo Mine. To provide power for thousands of Colorado homes and businesses, this colossal open pit mine has to deliver more than 2.3 million tons of coal per year. The whole world depends on electricity. And without coal, you have no electricity. Hitting those targets demands truly extraordinary machines. And they don't come much more extraordinary than the Marion 8050 walking drag line. Weight, 3,100 tons. Boom length, 325 feet. Bucket capacity, 62 cubic yards. Too big to move on wheels or tracks, the drag line walks on 58-foot-long steel shoes. The mining process begins with a big bang. Seventy-five tons of ammonium nitrate explosive shatters the layer of sandstone covering the 15-foot-thick coal seam. Then it's time for Tracy Mack and the mighty walking drag line to go to work. Are you in the clear? Everybody's in the clear. You can go to swing it. 10 4. Tracy swings the mighty machine's 325 foot long boom arm, and the bucket chews 82 ton mouthfuls from the layer of dirt known as overburden. I get to operate the, the biggest toy in the sandbox, and it's really cool. Man, this takes too much time. To keep up with the pace of production, another digger operates in tandem with the drag line. Yes, sir, go ahead. Don Hobbs operates the Bucyrus 495B mobile shovel. 614 coming at you. With its 6600 volt electrical power supply, it's not on the same scale, but it's still a mean machine. It's a monstrosity of a machine. That bucket holds 80 tons of dirt. 215, you mind backing up another 30 foot? 
I love operating that shovel. It's a challenge every day. But at an altitude of 7,000 feet, the air is dry, and the mine won't allow the big diggers to operate if they start kicking up too much dust. If there is a situation where the dust is overwhelming us, we will shut down. A shutdown costs the mine thousands of dollars, but with low visibility, lives are at stake, and they might have no choice. Grand Junction, Colorado. One week before Christmas, thousands of holiday travelers are pouring through the city's airport. It's a busier time of year for us. Over 40,000 on average per month travel through our airport. But during the holiday season, we see double that. But the Colorado winter is closing in. If we get a lot of snow, then it can impact flights. In the mountains to the east of the city, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration radar station tracks the constantly changing weather patterns, feeding data to the airport below. This is uh, very important that this weather radar operate uh, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. The radar is so critical, it's served by a team of dedicated technicians. Technical Chief Chris Cornvin has noticed something disturbing. We have an alarm on the radar. We're indicating some faults, which will take the radar down hard. It's up to Chris to get to the radar station and manually repair the problem. Let's uh, head up there and take a look at it. Let's grab our survival gear, parts, radios. You know, let's just get going. The radar station is 10,000 feet up on the snowy Grand Mesa and more than 15 miles from the nearest paved road. No ordinary vehicle can reach it. But the Snowcat 2000 XL is no ordinary vehicle. Weight, 8,000 pounds. Engine, 130 horsepower Cummings diesel. Speed, 20 miles per hour. Four giant rubber tracks give the snowcat less ground pressure per square inch than a walking man. Chris and his team need to reach the radar before the storm makes the mountain journey impossible. And they're running out of daylight. From the garage here, it's a 15 mile trip out across the mesa and a lot of different kinds of terrain in order to get to the radar site. So we really have to rely on them pretty heavily. They're expecting about another 12 inches of snow. So it's important for us to get up and, and get the system up and running. Let's get moving here, guys. The ultimate all-terrain vehicle, the Snowcat was originally designed by specialist engineering firm Tucker for managing ski slopes. But the 2000 XL variant used by NOAA has been specially adapted for military and search and rescue operations. The Snowcat has got uh, tracks uh, about uh, two and a half to three feet wide, and uh, it just floats over the top of the snow fairly easily. Two of the repair crew ride snowmobiles. They might be lighter, but they can't match the 2000 XL Snowcat's low ground pressure or its ability to pull loads up to 10,000 pounds. Last year, when I had gotten the, one of the snowmobiles stuck in the powder, I had gotten off the uh, snowmobile thinking I would be able to pull it out. And um, it was like jumping into water. I sunk in up to my shoulders. The repair team can't afford to get stuck if they're going to fix the radar in time to help thousands of air travelers. But there's trouble on the road ahead. We've got a lot of drifting in here. Any moment, you may uh, just turn suddenly and uh, you get thrown off the machine. Kalawile Mine, Colorado. The mighty walking drag line has to clear 80,000 tons of dirt to uncover the mine's 15-foot thick coal seam. 
But the big diggers won't work unless the operators know the dust is under control. Unless this water truck shows up soon, we're going to have to stop. About time you show up, get us some water. I'll fix this up right. The water truck arrives in time to damp down the dust, and the massive diggers get back to work. As far as the mud and the dust, there's a real fine line between not enough water and too much water. For haul truck drivers like Connie Archuleta, the extra moisture is bad news. It's definitely dangerous around here. The biggest problem with those big puddles like that that are deep, um, we have the wheel motors on both sides of the tires. They're electric. Electricity and water do not mix. Even shallow water can cause serious problems for the 320-ton haul trucks, which take away the coal revealed by Tracy's drag line. We have a lot of spring thaw. The frost is starting to come through, making it treacherous driving for the trucks. The potential of trucks sliding into each other during the thaw is pretty significant. Water slick roads are devastating to haul trucks. Um, you can roll one over. You never want to do damage to your equipment. The entire mine depends on these four-story high behemoth trucks. If they can't drive, the hard work done by Tracy and the walking drag line will count for nothing. Grand Junction, Colorado. The NOAA engineering team is depending on the 2000 XL Snowcat's incredible all-terrain mobility to get them to a vital weather radar station so they can make repairs before the incoming storm hits. Let's go, let's load up. Darkness is fast approaching. And we need to kind of get moving here because it gets dark up here fairly early. It gets dark around 4.30. We've got a lot of drifting in here, so it's like a roller coaster ride. Chris is racing against the clock, but putting the pedal to the metal puts the snowcat at serious risk. You kind of have to pay attention to the terrain that you're driving across. We'll get uh, drifts uh, 12 to 15 feet high. The thick snow can hide a multitude of dangers. Where there may be uh, some boulder just hiding under the snow ready to take out a track or something. And slow down a little bit in order to make it over them so we don't tear up the snowcat. As Chris navigates the deep drifts, the snowcat's vulnerable underbelly collides with a hidden boulder. Any damage to the bearings or hydraulics could stop the team in their tracks. Check the bearings. If you can check the bearings on that side, I want to have a look at that drive shaft yoke under here. Okay. This is the halfway point in the journey. Now they must make the critical decision whether to see it through to its end. If we have any leaks, any hot bearings, anything, then we need to, we know at this point we're halfway there, we gotta turn around and go back. Unless the snowcat can get moving, it's going to be a cold Christmas in Grand Junction. Kalawayo Mine, Colorado. The mighty walking drag line has to clear 80,000 tons of rubble by sundown to uncover the mine's coal seam. But operator Tracy has noticed a problem. Yeah, I'm kind of dragging the ropes over here. Can you come cut the edge for me? Yes, sir, I'll be right there. The ropes are the 3.2 inch thick steel cables which control the 30 foot wide bucket arm. The problem with the ropes dragging on the edge of the spoil where I'm digging is it wears the ropes out and you get premature failure. The only way to stop the ropes dragging is to clear earth from around the base of the drag line with a bulldozer. It extends the life when we can cut that edge with the dozer and keep from dragging the ropes in the rock or the dirt. And just do the best you can and it'll smooth her out with the bucket. This job demands inch-perfect control of the dozer on a steep gradient at the edge of a 50-foot precipice. The consequences of getting it wrong are serious. With premature failure in the ropes, there's extreme danger. 
the rope or chain could break and actually come back into the cab of the drag line. The man at the dozer controls is someone Tracy can trust, his son, Jason. Oh, what you needed? Yeah, that's perfect right there. The drag line's up and running, but the smaller Bucyrus 495B shovel that was helping out has been pushed hard. When operator Don comes back from his lunch break, he gets an unpleasant surprise. Holy freaking cow, what are you doing in my office? While the maintenance team work, the Bucyrus won't run. Does this mean I'm going to get to dig today? Going to no. make my shovel better? No, we're going to be working on this most of the afternoon and into the night. Today, they've shut my shovel down. That's putting a lot of pressure on the drag line. The drag line's really going to have to bust butt to cover for what I don't get done. With Don's shovel out of the game, hitting today's quota is a tall order for Tracy and the drag line. Grand Junction, Colorado. Chris Cornvin's team of technicians are stuck halfway through their 15-mile cross-country journey across the Grand Mesa Plateau to fix a problem in a vital weather radar. Yeah, we need to check, uh, check this yoke here. Even though we're in a hurry, uh, it's still a safety issue that we always check this kind of stuff. Are we good on the bearings on the other side? Yeah. yeah. All right. No leaks. Bearings are good. Time is ticking away. The crew just has to trust that the snowcat will hold together. We need to uh, push on here pretty fast. After another two hours driving, the radar station appears in the distance. But now there's only three hours of daylight left to get the job done and get back down the mountain. And the storm from the west is just six hours away. And now that we're here, we need to really get moving on this. Chris's crew wastes no time running a full diagnostic check on the radar systems to pin down the problem. We don't have a lot of time to get this done. Uh, you know, anytime it's down, it's down, and nobody gets the radar, so. Let's try cycling the power on it to see what happens. If that fixes it, then we get lucky. Nice. If not, we may end up having to spend a little bit of time here, but let's give it a try. This problem turns out to be a software issue. After some computer wizardry, the radar is working again. Grand Junction Airport can stay in business. The alarm has cleared, and we are headed back. OK, thank you. But now the three-man crew is stuck 10,000 feet up on the Grand Mesa, with just one hour of daylight left and a three-hour journey ahead. The sun is going down, so we do need to get out of here. As darkness falls, the temperature plummets. It's getting tougher and tougher to actually see the snow drifts. I am rather concerned about it. If they stay in the radar station, they'll be stuck there until the coming storm ends. But spending a night on the open mountainside is not an option. At night, after the sun goes down uh, in the winter time, it could easily get minus 20, minus 30 degrees below zero. Kalawayo Mine, Colorado. The Titanic walking drag line has shifted 40,000 tons of dirt. But that's only half the day's quota, and the big machine is feeling the strain. It, that don't look right. The left drag hitch pin is sticking out there a ways on the outside. I'll set the bucket down. Maybe you can go out and look at it. On the way. If a pin holding the giant bucket in place works loose, the consequences could be catastrophic. So Tracy calls in an engineer to assess the damage. The camper shut up the outside of there. It's not good news. The two foot long pin's in good shape, but the bolt that holds it in place, the keeper, is shot. And replacing it is a big job. 
We've got a keeper gone on one of our pins on a drag hitch. Can you pull her back on for us? 10-4, on my way. With the deadline looming, welder Press Merriam is on the scene in minutes. Get us back in the dirt. I'll get you back in the dirt. Well, check it out. I think I've got it to where you won't tear it up again. Yeah, that'll work for now. Finally, the drag line is back working at full speed. In spite of dust and meltwater, the workers of the Kalawile mine have beaten their towering daily quota. Grand Junction, Colorado. Thanks to the snowcat, the NOAA engineering crew has fixed the radar and they're heading home. But they still have a tough journey ahead of them. Then we have a long, hour-long drive back to uh, back to the office yet. Yeah. Not to mention, if we have to deal with any problems on the way, it'd be nice to have daylight to do that. It wouldn't be uh, a whole lot of fun being caught out here at night. So, just as the sun sets, Chris almost runs into an unexpected obstacle. Right in this area is where we had a tree fall across uh, earlier this year. We had to winch it back out of the way in order to get through. But he's not going to need the winch this time. This problem is seasonal. Under cover of darkness, a determined reveler is helping himself to a Christmas tree from the mountainside. That guy is really into the Christmas spirit. I guess we'll see what happens. With the path clear, Chris heads for home. One guy has his tree for Christmas, but thanks to the snowcat, the holiday travelers of Grand Junction have a working airport.